To better understand the relationship between humans and non-human things, let's look at two ideas that we can use to model that relationship, rivalry and excludability. Excludability is whether or not someone who didn't pay for a thing is allowed to use or has access to that thing. If they can use it without paying for it, we would call it non-excludable. This could be things like a nice view. You generally don't pay for it, but everyone can enjoy it. The use of public trash cans are non-excludable by design. Anybody walking by can just use it without having to pay. And the same goes goes for public roads. National defense, any effort to protect the country will protect everyone inside the country. It's not necessarily that people can't be excluded, but more that it's so hard or so expensive to do so that it's just not going to happen. For example, with an ocean resource, you could set up some sort of fleet of boats that surround or follow a fish resource around, making sure people don't use it, but it would almost definitely be more expensive than any monetary benefit those fish are giving people, and nobody would be willing to pay for the protection. Things that are excludable would include items in a store that you're not allowed to use if you don't buy them, access to phone and internet services that you have to pay to have access to, or use of farmland that you own or pay rent on to use, and most land in general, I guess. Rivalry is the idea that if you use it, someone else cannot use it, also called subtractability. Does one person using it subtract from someone else being able to use it? So most tangible goods are rivalrous. An apple in a store is rivalrous because once you've bought it, no one else can buy that same apple, and it's been used up. The use of a hammer in your house may also be rival because only one person can use it at a time. But it's not necessarily being used up the way other products like food might. After one person uses it, someone else can later. But they can't be using it at the same time. Compared to something like broadcast television, something that is non-rivalrous, you can use it at the same time as someone else. You can use it, your neighbor can use it, and you can both use it at the same time without affecting each other. Another example is a public highway. One person using it has no effect on someone else being able to use it. Although if you get technical, you could say no no one can use that specific section of highway while you're using it, then it does become rival in the exact same way that a hammer in your house is rival. Really, we describe something as being non-rival if the marginal cost of giving it to an additional person is zero. So what's the additional cost of broadcasting TV to another person in the broadcast zone? Well, it's zero. What's the additional cost to provide that road service to another person? It's zero too. But there are few, if any, truly non-rival goods or services. At some point, the marginal cost of supplying something to an additional person becomes greater than zero, or that thing can become less valuable with more people using it. A beautiful view, or a beach, is non-rival to a certain point. A highway is non-rival, but at a certain point, adding additional people makes it less useful. Then if you want to supply that same fast service, adding additional people does have a cost. If the TV broadcast zone is full, then you have to put up another tower in another area to supply more people. It's not so much a matter of are they rival or non-rival, but when does it become more expensive to supply something to an additional person? Sometimes it's right away because things can't be shared, and sometimes it takes a much larger volume of people because certain things can be shared. You can kind of run with this rivalry model in the other direction. Is there anything that becomes more valuable as more people use it? You could look at using phones this way. If it's the 1870s and you're the only one with a phone, it has no value. But as more of your friends have phones and more shops and services have phones, your phone becomes more and more useful. Excludability is also a range. You could set up a giant fence around a park to try to make it excludable, but people can find a way to get in if they want to, it just becomes more expensive to do so. Anyways, you can use these two properties to describe probably any situation you want with varying degrees of usefulness. So let's do that. Let's say everything can be either excludable or non-excludable, rivalrous or non-rivalrous. Things that are rivalrous and excludable we call private goods. These are cars, computers, food, clothing, private land. You have to pay for them and by acquiring them you are preventing someone else from having that same item. Something that is non-rivalrous but excludable, that is you have to pay for it or do something to help upkeep it, but all the people that have paid into it don't subtract from other people's ability to use it. We call collective or club goods. So that's like going to see a movie at a cinema, paying for TV channels with non-broadcast TV, or going to certain ecotourism spots. Things that are rivalrous and non-excludable we call common goods or common pool resources. This applies to a lot of natural resources like fisheries, forests, and certain water resources. It's hard 
hard to stop people from using them, and the items you take can't be shared with someone else. Finally, things that are non-rivalrous and non-excludable we call public goods. So that's like your free broadcast TV, scenic views, lighthouses, national defense, flood control systems. They're not called public goods because they are supplied by the government, but most examples you can come up with are goods that would be supplied by the government. Why is that? Let's say a company came in and wanted to make the air cleaner in a city. First of all, clean air is non-excludable. If you make the air cleaner, then everybody gets it regardless of whether they paid or not. So how do you convince people to pay if they're just going to get it for free anyways? Being a company and providing a public good is more of a charitable act than an interaction between customer and business. They could ask for donations, which is what a lot of internet companies like Wikipedia does. But you can get an unfair separation between people who are willing to pay and people who will free ride on the efforts of others. Which isn't necessarily bad, but if there's not enough people willing to pay, then it can be a problem. Because this is an issue of excludability, common goods can also have this free rider problem. Clean air is also non-rival. So with whatever number of people that are going to breathe the air, it's going to cost the same. So what should they charge each person, or what should each person be giving? It really depends on how many people are using it, or how many people live there, and how much are they each willing to pay, and how clean is clean enough? Because public goods are hard to put a price on, and it's hard to get people to pay, private companies typically don't provide public goods, and public goods tend to be the ones that the government takes care of using compulsory tax dollars. It can work, but you don't get an accurate or efficient outcome of who should be paying, how much they should be paying, and how much effort should be spent on this particular thing. With private goods, someone produces something, what it costs to make, or what its value is, is represented in the price. Only the person that paid for it gets to have it, so they don't have to worry about free riders. As people buy them, they will deplete, so the manufacturer manufacturer will know exactly how much to make and how much people like them. Okay, there's a problem here. For example, a fish is a common good here, but instantly becomes a private good once the fisherman has taken it out of the water. A hammer is maybe a private good in the store, but becomes a common good when you bring it back to your workshop. What's happening is, it's not the item that is classified under these different headings. An apple and a hammer don't really have the properties of being excludable or rivalrous, and clean air isn't a public good. What these describe is the relationships between you and society with regards to that good. It's the rules and laws that we make to say who can use it, how you can use it, when, how long, can you sell or give it away, can you sell or give away part of it. What rivalry, excludability, private good, public good describe is well, what the rules are. We call these rules property rights. It's your rights with regard to certain property. It's sort of the rules we make together about how we treat certain non-human things. And it's not just physical objects. Like we saw from the previous example, it can refer to a view. And it can also refer to how loud you're allowed to be in certain areas. Understanding what property rights are in place is an important step in understanding how things are managed. Or maybe how they should be managed. So to reiterate, excludability describes how easy or how hard something is to be accessed. Boundaries aren't just physical. They can be social contracts, like laws. Anything that can exclude people. Rivalry describes how expensive it is to supply something to another person, and whether that thing can be shared at the same time, at different times, or not at all.